All over the world today is being remembered as Pentecost. And that reminds us of the power of God that was made available on the day of Pentecost to the believers. It wasn't only for those that were there at that time, but that power is still available to us today. We notice that God is associated with power. In fact, some of the names of God actually reflect the power that God manifests, that God has. And the Bible tells us twice it has been said, well, once it has been spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. God is associated with power. And even right from creation, we saw his power being manifested the Holy Spirit was sovereign over the waters in the darkness. And through the Holy Spirit, when God spoke, then creation began. Things began to take shape and form. And what was void and formless become, or eventually became the beautiful world that we now see and enjoy. Again, even in the Old Testament, God manifested his power through the disciples or through the people that he called. And generally, you will notice when God calls a person and assigns a person to do any work, he will give them the power to do it. And that power may be manifested in various forms. When God called Moses, Moses felt inadequate. He felt unimportant. He felt he couldn't even speak, but God that called him, had equipped him with power. And God asked him the question, what is that in your hand? He says, it's a rod. And God says, through that rod, you will bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt into the promised land. Can I tell you that the power was not in the rod. The power was not in anything Moses was holding. The power was in God. But that uh, 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 stick in Moses' hand was to serve as a reminder, a contact point for the power that God has already put in Moses to carry out his work. Now, fast forward to the point that Joshua became a leader of the children of Israel. We didn't see God give Joshua anything like a rod. Moses had a rod, but Joshua wasn't given anything. The only thing that God gave Joshua, as we notice in the book of Joshua chapter one, Verse 6, it says, I am with you, just like I was with Moses. But he wasn't given a handkerchief. He wasn't given a stick. He wasn't given any symbol. And that tells you that the power of God is intrinsically a, a, a part of God himself. And when God is with you, that power is manifested. And through the power of God in Joshua, Joshua took the children of Israel in to possess the promised land. Um, all through the Old Testament, we notice the power of God coming upon people. Samson was another clear illustration of power of the Holy Spirit coming upon him. When the power comes, he can kill a lion. He can kill thousands of uh, the enemies with just the jawbone of an ass. So we notice that power is associated with God. And the Holy Spirit, of, of course, is the means through which God uh, manifests his power throughout the world. And you can see many passages in, this, in the scripture, like Isaiah 59, uh, verse 19, telling us that when the enemy comes, God, the Holy Spirit will raise up a standard against uh, him. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ, we are told, was filled with the Holy Spirit without measure. He was uh, uh, right from birth. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then at his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. And that was to signify the continuous presence. And of course, it was 
to be a sign that should enable other people and particularly John the Baptist to know that this is the Messiah that is come into the world so he can confirm it uh, to other people and help them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus Christ died, resurrected, and before he ascended to heaven, he gave the disciples a charge that don't leave Jerusalem until you be endued with power. And um, they started until the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. That means 50 days from the day Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. And 10 days after he ascended to heaven, the Holy Ghost came down on the apostles. And you will notice that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, it transformed them, it changed their life, it changed their ministry, it transformed the fearful people into people of power that went everywhere, preached the gospel, performed signs and wonders, miracles, and nothing could stop them, nothing could hinder them. The question is, were they the only people that were supposed to receive the Holy Spirit? You know, there are a number of people that tell us today, oh, that uh, 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 speaking in tongues, Holy Spirit baptism has ended. It, it only came upon the disciples as evidence of the birth of the church. And that since then, we are not supposed to have that experience anymore. But let's go back to the scripture. Let's see what uh, uh, the Bible actually tells us about this. And if it was only meant for them alone, then why are we celebrating Pentecost today? Are we just celebrating history? No, because the power is meant for us. And today, we want to appropriate that power, flow in that power, live in the fullness of that power, and uh, realize the benefits of that power in our life and individual circumstances in Jesus' name. You remember when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles? On the day of Pentecost, people, and they were speaking in, in tongues. Even though they saw the tongues of fire on their head, even though they heard the sound of the Holy Spirit like of a rushing mighty wind coming upon them, and these people started speaking in tongues, but there were people that didn't understand what was happening. People that doubted and said, uh-uh, what is going on here? Why are these people speaking in different languages? And they said, ah, it must be that these people are drunk. They have uh, uh, taken some wine. And Peter caught up and spoke to them and says, man, don't think that we are drunk. We've not drunk, uh, we've, we've not taken any wine. Look, it is very early in the morning, nine o'clock. It's not yet time to start uh, drinking all this wine. So what you notice here happening is what was prophesied by Joel. Joel has lived and died before this thing happened. But the word of God doesn't have expiration there. When God has spoken a word, that word remains alive. And if you appropriate that word today, it will become real in your situation and circumstance. In Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 29, look at what Joel said. He says, and it shall come to pass afterward. Actually, Joel was pre -pre prophesying about the end time, about the last days. He says, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Job, uh, sorry, Joel make it clear there that God will pour out his spirit. And that pouring out will be upon all flesh. Now, that is important because all flesh means I am included. You are included. It is like when rain falls. When rain is falling, if you run inside a shelter and stay inside your house, in undercover, 
then the raindrops will not touch you. You remain dry. But if you go out into the rain, the rain will touch you. Your body will become wet and refreshed by that rain. Why am I using that illustration? That the same thing is, I, the, that, that is a kind of illustration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is coming upon all flesh. But it is only those that will go out, that will seek, that will appropriate, that will receive, that will begin, that, that will be able to uh, 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 have the benefit of that Holy Spirit. So Peter got up and explained to them. In fact, you find the story of that uh, fulfillment of Joel's prophecy in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, reading there from verse 1. It says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven of, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It's a long passage. You can read down to the very end. And it was as a result of that Holy Spirit outpouring and Peter's preaching that 3,000 people got converted in one day. It tells you what difference the Holy Spirit can make in the life of a person. Now, the Holy Spirit is a person. It's not just a force. It's not just an influence. But that is not the purpose of my message today. So instead of uh, going through all that, I want to focus on uh, uh, us appropriating it. In fact, there was a time if you go to our website, you'll find the outline and the audio uh, messages on the Holy Spirit. We did a, a long series on the Holy Spirit, and we were blessed looking at different ramifications of it and different aspects and what the scripture speaks about them. But in this particular message today, I just want us to plunge in, launch in, and really uh, uh, receive and get this power and begin to uh, uh, flow in it. Let it make a difference in your life, a difference in my life. You know, the Holy Spirit is so important and so powerful uh, that Jesus Christ actually told the disciples that it's better for me to go away because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. When I go away, I will send the promise of my Father to you. He will be with you and he will be in you. And that's the main difference between the Holy Spirit in the New Testament and the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. In the Old, Old Testament, it mostly came upon the people for a particular service, a particular activity. But in the New Testament, God promised he will come in you and live in you. You can have the abiding uh, presence of the Holy Spirit and continue to walk and fellowship with him, be guided by him, be directed by him, and uh, a, 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 a be blessed by the Holy Spirit. So many years passed before Acts chapter 2. And it's in Acts chapter 2 that we've just read, we find the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. Well, whatever prophecy God has made for, given to you, it will come to pass. Time may uh, be long, but it will come to pass. Therefore, you don't give up. You don't uh, <clears throat> throw it away. You don't throw in the towel. Uh, because when, when God speaks, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 55, the word that comes out of the mouth of God, it cannot return back to God void. It must accomplish the thing it purpose and prosper in those very things. And so today, I am going to focus on God. I want to focus on, on the promise of God about the Holy Spirit. And I want you to be that focused as well. And says, God, this promise is for me. I want to appropriate it in my life. So as I mentioned in that Acts chapter 2, if you read on the letter part, you'll see that um, people started saying or talking that, look, these people must be drunk with wine. And Peter, hearing that, Peter that denied Jesus Christ three times, 
But now the Holy Spirit has come and he was transformed. He was changed. He got up and started pre uh, preaching to them. He says, don't think that we are drunk. No, it's too early. It's only 9 a.m. in the morning. But what you see happening here is the fulfillment of the promise that Jesus Christ made. It's also a fulfillment of the prophecy that is written in your law, in your book, in the book of Joel. And he went back, explained that passage to them. He says, uh, he told them there in that place, uh, 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 well, as I not, as I read to us earlier on, that when Joel prophesied, he says, uh, the God will pour out the spirit upon all flesh, all, not some. Uh, uh, everybody can get this, everybody that wants. Remember Jesus Christ, the message he gave in uh, John chapter 7, on the last day of the feast that Jesus cried, cried out with a loud voice and says, whosoever is hungry and thirsty, let him come and drink of the water of life. So it takes hungry, being hungry for the Holy Spirit, testing and desiring for the Holy Spirit to actually get that blessing. As Peter continued explaining to them, he cut to the point of telling them in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, he says, and the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. You see, the way Peter understood that prophecy of Joel, he didn't see it as a one-off activity that just happened to them on that day and it will never happen again. He didn't see it as something that just came uh, to establish the church on that particular day, and once the church is, is established, the Holy Spirit finishes work and go back to heaven. No, in fact, we are now living in the age of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is here carrying out the work that Jesus Christ started and doing it uh, uh, in line with the will of God and the word of God. So Peter explained to them that this promise is unto you. Who are the unto you? you people that are hearing me now, that it is not for a special class of people only. It's not for only those of us that are disciples of Jesus Christ or, uh, uh, or followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that this promise is also unto you. And does that not agree with what Joel pro uh, prophesied when Joel said all flesh, all flesh can receive of that power of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, not only to you, to your children, and that includes children that may not have been there in that meeting. Children that were going to be born in future. It says God's word and promise is for everybody. And look, do you notice the next phrase? He says, and to all that are afar off. Afar off. You can trans, uh, translate that afar off in different ways. It could be people that are far off from Jerusalem, <clears throat> like people in other countries. So it is not meant for only the Israelites. It is not only meant for those that are in Jerusalem. It is meant for those that are afar off in different countries, all the continents of the world, they can receive it. Afar off can also apply. You know, he was talking about to your children. He says, and to all those that are afar off, all the future children that are going to be born. The future ones that will be born, maybe in a hundred years' time, or a thousand years' time, or two thousand years' time, it is for all of them. And if the world continues till three thousand years, till three thousand years' time, as many as are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The call of God is for everybody. The Bible says, many are called, but few are chosen. The people that respond to the call of God and give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ and yield to God and live for God become the people that will receive the Holy Spirit, that will get this promise fulfilled in their life. But remember, the promise is for everyone. Anybody can get converted. Anyone can come to God. God doesn't dis uh, uh, discriminate between any uh, uh, individual more. No, he, 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 he calls everyone. Jesus didn't die for only a select 
uh, 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 type of people. No, he died for the entire world. And so anybody that comes, receive Jesus Christ into his or her life and allow Jesus to rule in his uh, or her life has the uh, privilege of moving forward and receiving the Holy Spirit. There is also some confusion that people bring about. And there are people that tell us, oh, yes, uh, every, every, everybody that is born again has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Actually, what they mean is they have confused uh, the measure of the Holy Spirit that the Bible talks about with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, the Bible talks about uh, the measure of the Spirit, that when a person becomes a Christian, become born again, God seals that individual with a measure of the Holy Spirit. So technically, every Christian, every born-again person has a measure of the Holy Spirit in his life. But remember, even when Jesus Christ was alive, he ministered to the apostles. At a point, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. That means they had the Holy Spirit inside of them because Jesus breathed on them. But the same people that Jesus breathed on are the people that Jesus says, don't leave. Don't launch out your ministry yet. Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with the Holy Spirit. So, they had the Holy Spirit inside of them, but they were to wait until the fullness of power comes and they be endued. So they waited, and on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came and uh, they baptized them and they started speaking in new tongues. So those that are born again, that have got a measure of the Holy Spirit in them, still need to press on, still need to push on and says, God, I want to have all that Jesus Christ purchased for me at Calvary. I want to have all that <clears throat> uh, Calvary bought for me. I want to have the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Because when the fullness of the Holy Spirit comes and takes over our lives, it makes a difference. It makes us uh, uh, more fruitful for God. It makes it transform our lives and make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Why were the believers called Christians at Antioch? Because they had the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moved in them. And the Holy Spirit uh, translated uh, all that God wanted them to be into their lives that other people could see the example and the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ in the way they were uh, uh, living. So we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is for everybody, all, everybody. In fact, in Acts chapter 6, there is an incident that took place then. Acts chapter 6 is after Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 reminds us of the Pentecost. And so Acts chapter 6 tells us these events happen after Pentecost, after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People have known about the Holy Spirit. They've received the Holy Spirit and they relish in the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 6, we find that there was a problem in the early church, murmuring, because some of the widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And the murmuring came to the apostles. And the apostles says, well, we don't want problem. We don't want murmuring because it will destroy the atmosphere where God can reach and bless the people. We need to solve this. And the way to solve it is to make provision. We should have people to share food equally among all these people so that everybody has a share and they can be happy. And the apostle said, but we don't want to abandon the call of God upon our lives. We are called to pray. We are called to preach the gospel. We are called to study the gospel. And that is a priority. We want to give ourselves to that priority, priority of uh, 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 ministering the word of God, reading the word of God, studying the word of God. And that is what every one of us still needs to do. Because if we are not sound in the teaching, in the knowledge of the word of God, we cannot really 
uh, give out to people. We cannot minister effectively. You cannot give out what you don't have. So the apostle said in Acts chapter 6, verse 2 to 4, let's see here what the apostle said. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and save tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will keep ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word of God. You would have thought that physical works like distribution of the food doesn't require Holy Spirit. No. Anything that is done for God, anything that is done in the name of God, any service that you want to render to God, if that service is going to be effective, is going to be fruitful, is going to bless people, you need the presence of the Holy Spirit. We've already established that every one of us need the Holy Spirit. Even if your work, uh, uh, what you are doing is sharing testimony, if the testimony is going to minister to people, you need the Holy Spirit. If it is just singing, playing keyboard, being a leader in the church, going out to distribute leaflets uh, or preach the gospel to other people, being officials in the ministry, uh, uh, whatever kind of work that we do when we used to meet physically in the uh, 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 in Karikan Center, uh, we had a lot of other things to do, like arranging the chairs, arranging the books, uh, 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 taking care of the offering, operating laptop, projector, camcorder, recording, a Zoom, or whatever. All these are things we do. And we are, as long as we are doing it for the Lord, in the name of the Lord, then we need to recognize that God's work needs to be done with the help of the Spirit of God. Because if we don't do that, we will be despising the gift of God. And it can be very disastrous when, if we despise the gift of God because we'll be trying to do the work in our own power, in our own mind. And may our sister earlier on mentioned and, and mistakes that Joshua made after he has started getting some victory. You know, that is exactly what normally happens to believers when they get born again newly. Oh, they fear God, they love God, they pray, they're always seeking counseling, seeking guidance. I, I, I don't want to make a mistake in anything. And that was the way Joshua was earlier on. But after God has been with them, given them victory, and they were now uh, confident that our God is able to do everything for us. We are told it came to a point that after they've gotten victory over Jericho, when they were to fight the next battle, they didn't go to ask God. They just say, ah, well, send some spies, go and look. The spies came back and say, oh, it's a small town. This one will be a walkover. Don't send all the men of war. Just send a few thousands and let them go and finish the work for us. They got defeated seriously because they were not following the counsel of God. Fast forward, when uh, the sin of Achan was discovered and Achan was eliminated and they were now going to go and fight AI, what did God tell them? How did God tell them to do? God says, all the soldiers must go. You know, the experts were saying, don't send everybody, just send a few because it's a small town. But what did God say? Everybody must go. God gave them strategy. We need the guidance and strategy of God. And sister also mentioned another point, how the Kibionites came and deceived uh, the children of Israel. When they came, Joshua didn't pray. The elders didn't ask God. They just listened to the story. You know, there are times you listen to stories. The story is so convincing. It's so, uh, in fact, you think this can only be from God because you can see the way the thing went, the way the thing did, did this. Uh, in fact, they presented the bread they brought, the shoes, uh, and they told the stories around it to make it appear that the shoes were new when they started the journey. The bread was baked newly, but now because of the long journey, the bread has become moldy and the shoes 
have become worn out. You know, those are convincing evidence. The facts around you can be so convincing, but it doesn't mean it is true. It doesn't mean it is of God. That is why God tells us we need to be careful, especially in these last days, because Satan has disguised himself like angel of light. He can come with a, a presentation with facts that almost convince you that this cannot be anything other than God, and yet you can be deceived. So we mustn't despise or reject the Holy Spirit. We mustn't despise the gift of God. If we, we need to be very serious, examining ourselves and asking God, are we still full of the Holy Spirit? Are we living in the power of the Holy Spirit? Are we following the Holy Spirit? If not, then we need to uh, uh, change right now and ask God, God, today we are remembering Pentecost and it's not just for historical past. I want you to fill me today with the Holy Spirit. Remember what Paul, uh, Peter said in his sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of this Holy Spirit. And to them, as many as will repent, as many as will call upon God and say, God, feel me, feel me, the Holy Spirit will come upon such an individual. In Acts 2, he told them, repent and be baptized. That was water baptism. But if you fast forward to Acts chapter 10, in the house of Colonial, it wasn't repent and be baptized. In fact, while he was still praying, the Holy Spirit came upon them before they were baptized in water. <clears throat> and when he saw that the Holy Spirit has come upon them, uh, the Gentiles, as it came upon uh, the apostle, uh, uh, Peter said, who am I to resist God? He then baptized them in water, meaning that the, you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit before water baptism if you've not yet been baptized in water. So look at it there. We need to examine ourselves and check up and say, am I living in under the power of the Holy Spirit? I think it was last Thursday during family devotion here. I wasn't the one that led. It was a children, one of them that led the family the devotion. And the passage she, the, uh, uh, she chose was Galatians chapter 5. And I'll just mention one of, one of those verses, verse 25. That verse spoke volumes to us. It says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. In other words, there is no point saying, I, I, I'm, I'm spiritual. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit uh, 10 years ago. I spoke in tongues, I've been speaking in tongues, but the Bible is saying, examine yourself. Is the Holy Spirit in charge of your life? Is the Holy Spirit controlling your life? You can't say, I speak in tongues, and yet the anchor from your mouth is uh, like a volcano uh, erupting. You can't say, I am I filled with the Holy Spirit, and yet your conduct, your language, your attitude, it's not directed by the Holy Spirit. It's not aligned with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the work of the Holy Spirit. God is telling us, check up yourself. Examine yourself. Is the Holy Spirit there? Is he manifesting? Are you maintaining that relationship with the Holy Spirit? Has he cleansed your life? Has he pushed your life? Has he pushed your tongue? Has he circumcised your hand? Has he changed you to me, give you the conduct? that will glorify God, that wherever you are, whatever you do, your life manifests, radiates the power of the Holy Spirit and bring glory to God. So, friend, if that is not the case in your life, today is that day. The day of opportunity for you to come to God and say, Lord, let that Holy Spirit come upon me afresh. Let that Holy Spirit walk in me, have his full way in my life. Let the Holy Spirit circumcise my tongue, cleanse my mouth, make my words to be uh, 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 holy and pure, make my conduct in life to be Christ-like so that other people will be able to say, I can see the, uh, uh, the evidence of the Holy Spirit walking in this person's life. 
and they'll be able to say, like uh, they call the Christians in Antioch believers uh, for, for the first time. So today is our opportunity, our day of receiving the Holy Spirit. And we're going to pray shortly. I want to just remind you that the early church had their Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. That was about 2,000 years ago. Joel and Peter, in their prophecy and preaching, both pointed out that the promise is for all from uh, uh, and to all from all ages, everybody in all ages. And therefore, today is my day for Pentecostal fullness, for the filling of the Holy Spirit, and for the Holy Spirit taking over my life, manifesting in my life. It is a day I need to renew my fellowship, my relationship with the Holy Spirit, and begin to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, and let the Holy Spirit lead me, let the Holy Spirit direct me, let the Holy Spirit guide me. Brethren, when you live a life that is guided by the Holy Spirit, you will find that the Holy Spirit will guide you aright. I mean, I learn every day now to ask the Holy Spirit for help, to guide me, to direct me in what he wants me to do. Yesterday, for example, when I woke, woke up in the morning, there were so many thoughts of what I needed to do. You know, there is always a lot to do. Many ideas were coming and so on. I just uh, turned to the Holy Spirit. I said, Holy Spirit, you are my guide. I want you to guide me. These are all the things that are coming onto my mind. I want you to orchestrate what I do today so that I will do it just what you want me to do. Do you know that at the end of the day, when I look back, I notice my plan had changed totally, completely from those ideas that came. And it was the Holy Spirit that orchestrated things and led me to doing those very things. Even this morning, when I woke up at first, there were a number of ideas that came to my mind, what I should do, what I should do. And here and there, again, I spoke to the Holy Spirit. And I said, Holy Spirit, over to you. I want you to lead how today turns out to be, what I do. And so, I mean, some of those things I, I, that came to my mind were things I wanted to do early in the morning before the church started. But when I handed over to the Holy Spirit right like that, the Holy Spirit took over. And the program changed. And the, uh, the things that I did changed. And I thank God they changed for the better. I want to lead, live a life that is guided, that is directed by the Holy Spirit. It's not just because this idea came to my head. I drew up this plan. I must follow it mechanically and so on. No, I want to be led and to be directed, to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit leads, he leads aright. He leads to things that are important, to things that will add value, to things that will be a blessing. We are now going to talk to God in prayer. And I want you to call upon the Lord. I want you to ask God to help you. And I want you to uh, uh, renew your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Let him become your friend, your leader, your, uh, 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 your partner. Let him be your guide. Let him direct everything that you need to do. Pray, and if you are not baptized by the Holy Spirit, today is the opportunity for you to get that experience. Go to God and say, God, today is my day. Today is my turn. I will not leave. I will not let you go until you bless me. Bless me today. Fill me today. Unker and taste after the Holy Spirit, and you will receive the power and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This time to pray. Call upon God right now. <clears throat>